Okay, thank you everybody. Um, thanks for coming along to this provocation. Um, it was, I'll give you a little bit of an information about myself first of all. Uh, my name's John Holt. I was a teacher for many years. Then I worked for the Arts Council. Then I went to teach at Bretton Hall College where I actually, I think there was about, well there's at least one of my students here. There's if two, three of my students here today who, I, who were uh, at the college. Um, I variously taught in the School of English, taught fine art, MA course and so on. I was always interested in non-Western cultures. I've always been interested in the marginalised. I've always been interested in, in, in people who didn't seem to fit, that were outsiders. And I did a lot of work with Native American Aboriginal artists, worked in Pakistan, and since I retired from, I was, you know, eventually Leeds University, I founded Artists in Mind, which is an arts and mental health charity. So I've been always, always been interested in the other, the, the marginalised. It's always fascinated me, wherever the voices of the marginalised come from. And what I've chosen to do is to choose three select groups, really, today. And the first is Native Americans. The second is black and Asian artists of, of British origins. And the third is those, that genre or area of people who are defined as having mental illness. Um, I'm going to start off with um, looking at this uh, particular artist. This, this slide is born from Sharp Rocks. It's an epigrammatic installation by an artist called Edgar Heap of Birds. He defined himself as a warrior artist. It's very interesting. You're probably aware of the, the background to Native American culture, the, the oppression, the, the genocide, the marginalization, uh, to the assimilation, the way that white America was never comfortable with its indigenous people. So what really fascinated me about Native Americans were, here was the, the most dominant culture in the world, the American culture, which had a voice, its indigenous peoples, who it seemed to want to eradicate, it seemed to want to get rid of them. And what really interested me was the, the voice that came through, through the arts of Native Americans. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit. It's, it's really short in, you know, this probably, it's only 10 minutes, this provocation, and then we're going to have a discussion. So this, this idea of the warrior artist who defends his people, who his tribe through the use of language was never more the, uh, evident than in this particular artist, Havichi Heap of Birds, who is Cheyenne Ar Arapaho. He's a, he's a Native American and he used, he uses what he's doing is confronting us with, our, with, with direct references, natural, living people, don't want Indians, just their names, mascots, machines, cities, products, buildings. Because a lot of, a lot of all those things are, are coming from Native American culture. And he's trying to remind us or shock us into, into thinking again about their, their, their place in the world. And this is, born from Shark Rocks, Edgar Heaperbirds talks about it, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote him in this. He said, the native arrow points of the past were worked and formed to become sharp and strong weapons. These sharp rocks were responsible for the defense and welfare of the tribe. As weapons of war, the sharp rocks of the Cheyenne were used for two separate purposes, as the defense of attack weapons against man and as tools of preservation through hunting. At this time, the manifestations of our battle has changed. This is him talking about the battle for survival of his people, right? This, this is the Native American people, the Cheyenne. The white man shall always project himself into our lives using information that is provided by learning institutions and the electronic and print media. Through these experiences, the non-Indian will decide to accept or reject that the Native Americans are a unique and separate peoples with the mandate to maintain and strengthen indigenous rights and beliefs. Therefore, we find the survival of our people is based upon our use of expressive forms of modern communication. The insurgent messages within these forms must serve as a present-day combative tactics. He's using art as a mechanism to challenge the, the, the assault upon his culture, his people. I'm asking, where, where else is this happening? Where, is these, where are these voices? 
As a native artist, he said, these insurgent messages delivered through art must present the fact that Native Americans are decidedly different from the dominant white culture of America. The worldview in which we hold is a creation of our circular awareness of self-determination. So he, he makes these enormous installations, Don't Want Indians, Nativists, Payne and Yorit. Um, he, he says that regretfully when the true Native American art is finally accepted, the style turns out to be that which fulfills the comfortable fantasy held by the non-Indian. One of the things about the marginalized is very often there's an expectation that your work is like this, that it's exoticized, that it, be, you know, that it has to be what the dominant culture wants it to be. So it asks of you, that, oh, why isn't your work like this? So what I'm looking at here is a certain ten ten tendency towards a turning point when the voices of the marginal, where voices emerge from the obscurity and make a difference. And so even the platform that they work in. So Native American artists were not shown in contemporary galleries until the 60s. They were only, uh, their work was only exhibited in ethnographic museums. Contemporary art galleries did not show their work. Now, I'm using these, you know, this is an exemplar. These are, this is, I'm looking at this as a case study, if you like, for maybe what's, what you might feel are marginal voices today. This is a, a piece of work by a painter called Oscar Howe, who is Sue, and it's called Ghost Dancers. And it's, it's a fairly abstract piece of work. Um, he submitted a painting to the Philbrook Art Centre in 1958 and it was rejected. They wouldn't show it. They wouldn't show his painting. He, he, he obviously was a, a Native American amongst lots and lots of white artists putting their work in. And he, um, he responded to this rejection. What they said to him is that this work wasn't Indian enough. It wasn't Indian enough, I thought. So he wrote an amazingly moving letter, and I'll just read a little bit of this. Dear Mr. Snodgrass, Snodgrass was the, the curator, whoever said that my paintings are not in the traditional Indian style has poor knowledge of Indian art indeed. Are we to be held back forever with the one phase of Indian painting that is the most common way? Are we to be herded like a bunch of sheep with no right for individualism, dictated to as the Indian has always been, put on reservations and treated like a child, and only the white man knows what's best for him. But one could easily turn to become a social protest painter. I only hope the art world will not be one more contributor to holding us in chains. So what Oscar was saying basically, you know, you're exoticizing me, you're just placing me in a box that you want me to be in, and I don't match up to it because my work was abstract, so therefore you exclude me. This is a piece of work by Cherokee artist Jimmy Durham. It's a self-portrait. Jimmy Durham was one of the most powerful uh, contemporary voices to challenge the rather reductionist and marginalized voice of modern America. He counters the cherished white liberal image of Indianness, the noble savage stereotype. He took a stereotype and he, he, he kind of subverted it. And there's, I mean, you know, there's, there's all the kind of, there's lots and lots of text on, on this particular painting um, and he, where, in which he images himself. Um, he attacks the museological context, which I explained before, into which native peoples are placed and confronts us with assemblages of found objects constructed into parodies of the Indian as misrepresented by the establishment view. I once saw Jimmy at the ICA and he, he had a whole series of sculptures on the wall. He makes these kind of fetish objects that, that are almost like magic objects, but they're, they're not the satirical, they're, they may not be. And he interviewed one of his sculptures, and, but he didn't speak. He just, it was just, he almost kind of whispered, we didn't hear anything. It was as though there was something magical happening between him and his work, as though it was a kind of shamanic exchange. But he was playing around with the stereotype, just trying to challenge us into thinking about what his relationship was with the art world and, and with, 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 with art itself, which was really, really interesting. This is another one of Jimmy's works, which again, it's called uh, uh, La, La Maniche. And it's, it's a kind of reading of a, of a woman who has, 
you know, there's a kind of sexual in, implication in there. There's a, you know, the, this, is, this is the Indian squaw, the kind of stereotypes again, where he, f with found objects and, and the way that he, um, he kind of uh, assembles it. Uh, there's a whole sort of narrative behind this piece. One of the problems of the reading of something called the other, and I, maybe that's a term I have, I use marginal, I use the word the other, which means something that we're not, you know, something else, is that we need to enter into a relationship with the work in a new way. How do we engage with the work of a culture. How do we you know, engage with Aboriginal work or work from India, works of, of a culture that we, we don't have any particular, well, we don't belong to that culture. Um, and, and there's a, an amazing piece of writing by Nicholas Deleary, who's a Native American professor at a university in America, in, in, uh, well, in, sorry, in Canada, Ontario. And he says, a really interesting thing about engaging with the other. He says, if we choose to understand and sensibly appreciate native culture, way of life and spirituality, we must be willing, first of all, to accept that there is involved a very special way of seeing the world. Secondly, and a necessary further step, we must make an attempt to participate in this way of seeing. The implications are very serious. Quite simply, if we're to accomplish this, it can mean a significant transformation in our thinking and living in the world. If we are not willing to consider another way of seeing the world and possibly eliminate entirely our chances of even really understanding native peoples and their ways. So, so this can be said of any, any genre of art, any type of art, cultural work, which is not of our culture. Is it's, he's saying that we have to meet it halfway. We have to give ourselves to that. It's, it's a leap that we have to take. And, you know, if you were interested in Carl Jung and, and, and that the speaker before was talking about the idea of, of there being templates of rhythms and forms of music within us all, within the brain, I think that there are also archetypes. There are things that move us, that, that are found, you know, throughout the world. There are symbols like chevrons and spirals, which are there in every culture, which are self-evident in the culture of the Navajo, of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of, of, of India and so on. Uh, of the Celts even. And so there are ways that we can engage with this work, but we must give ourselves to it. I want to talk a little bit now, uh, move on to uh, the voices in, in Britain. Uh, oh, that's another piece of Jimmy's, where he's just, just taken a police department um, sort of in sign and, and, and made it into a fetish object, the way that he fetishizes things. Um, in 1978, uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom, there was a Pakistani artist called Rashid Areen who realised that something had to be done about the complete absence of the British art scene of artists of Asian and African origin. It just was not in evidence, hardly at all. There just wasn't. That work was not being seen. It wasn't being shown in galleries. Uh, this was in the uh, late 70s. They were excluded from the official exhibitions, art histories and other mainstream institutions. I mean, how many of you have been in, you know, university uh, libraries and seen books on the history of Chinese contemporary art or of African art or of native? It's got better, but, it, but there, were, there wasn't those. Those histories were not there. They were not there. They were not being taught. You know, uh, when I was lecturing, it was, it was always usually a white male history that, that we always had to face. There was, there was never any histories of others. So... Um, so what Rashid Areen did, who, Rashid Areen was a Pakistani artist. He, he came from Pakistan to work in this country. He's a sculptor. He wrote a letter to the Arts Council to bring this situation to their notice and proposed that fund, a funded research be, should be undertaken. Their response was no, absolutely not. They would not do it, not even a discussion of the matter. It was a very depressing response for him. What else could he do to persuade the art establishment to recognise the seriousness of the matter? In 82, he approached the Greater London Arts Association, where he knew some people, with a proposal to begin research and set up an archive of the history of Afro-Asian artists in Britain. Their response was positive at last. This was the beginning of the struggle of the work of Black Umbrella and the publication Third Text. I used to write for Third Text. Third Text is third world perspectives on, on, on contemporary culture. It's a very, very exciting radical journal. It's been going for many years now. 
So he founded uh, Third Text and formed Black Phoenix, um, uh, which is a unique critical and theoretical perspectives, mainly um, black and Asian and critical uh, writers writing for this text, very, very important in this country. Then he curated a big show at the Hayward Gallery um, called The Other Story. Um, so uh, this was a big thing. This was the first time this, this piece of work here is, is from that exhibition. Um, he sought to demonstrate and legitimize the suppressed history of modernist aesthetic among the British visual artists of African, Caribbean and Asian ancestry. The other story was understood internationally, if not domestically, as a major breakthrough in, in de-imperializing the institutional mind. So what he did was he put on this show. It wasn't perfect. A lot of people criticized it. There weren't many women showing in it. Uh, Sonia Boyce, I think, was one of the few of those of you who have awareness of anything about the about, uh, history of British contemporary painting. But it was an exhibition of, of some significance. Um, the, uh, couched as a celebration of achievement, Irene's catalogue text leaves us in no doubt that the absence of black and Asian artists from the history of British modernism and national patrimony could only be attributed to racist discrimination. Guy Brett's catalogue essay suggested this exclusion was symptomatic of a wider malaise in the British art establishment which he described as an antiquated and still basically beau art model that consistently failed to recognize the experimental and transitional in its midst. The other story was one of several multi-stranded initiatives by Reen and other artists to construct a cultural and archival counter memory. This is written by Jean Fisher, who was then the editor, is a good friend of mine, she's at Goldsmiths, and she, she edited um, Third Text for many years. This is Eddie Chambers' work, the, it's the deconstruction of the National Front from 1980. I, I've just put this in because this is a collage, four panels, each four by 12 inches. So not long after the Conservatives gained power in Britain under Margaret Thatcher, Eddie Chambers, a young black art student, tore a print of the Union Jack into pieces and reassembled it into the shape of the swastika. Uh, the result was a powerful and controversial statement about what he saw as the appropriation of the country by racist ideologues. In the work, Destruction of the National Front, the Union Jack swastika occupied the first four panels and the other three chambers gradually dissembled the image until it became an unrecognisable collection of fragmented colours and shapes like the twist of a kaleidoscope that causes an immediate bl imme a blur before it resolves itself into a new pattern. His final panel offered the possibility of transformation. So this was what a lot of you know, young black artists were doing, inspired, as I say, by the, the other story at the, at, the, uh, at the Hayward Gallery. This is Sheila Berman, who is um, an artist Again, from Blackpool, uh, mum and dad were, uh, had, had an ice cream uh, business um, uh, of Indian descent. And um, this, is, this is Sheila countering the kind of passivity of the Asian woman. She's, she's a martial artist. She's going for you. She's aggressive. She's powerful. Um, uh, I, I'll just quote a little bit from Sheila's work. She's just taking art from the margins and saying, no, I will not accept this stereotype. Since the mid-1980s, I have been exploring the experiences and aesthetics of Asian femininity in paintings and installations, photography and printmaking, video and film. In more recent works, this theme has been taken on a new power and vibrancy, challenging stereotypical assumptions of Asian women. My work is informed by popular culture, Bollywood, fashion, found objects, the politics of femininity, the celebration of femininity, the self-portraiture exploring the production of my own sexuality and dynamism, the relationship between popular culture and high art, gender and identity politics. Um, uh, Shell has been here. She's, I wrote a piece uh, of a review of a show she did at the, uh, at, the, um, at, the at the art gallery here some years ago. Did anybody see that, this woman's work? No? Fantastic show. Uh, and that's another, it is almost, um, that's another, posi it's called Positions in 34 Years, um, where she's, she's again, all, all those images of herself and and kind of dressing up. I think she was, was a bit like the culture club, you know, uh, sort of image that she was playing around with at that time. And there, another, just, just a complete collage, almost like a Bollywood collage, but this is her in, in, in so many different guises, in so many different ways. This is how I can be. Look, I can be many things uh, within, within this culture. 
She's speaking out against the kind of notions of the stereotype and continues to do so to this day. Art from the margins has more than often been connected with the notion of uh, the idea of an outsider. Um, I have some problems with the notion of the outsider. There is something called outsider art and uh, for many years I, I have been involved with, with that idea of uh, art in the margins which, is, which came out of a tradition from a long time ago of something called art of the insane. From, there's a, a psychiatrist called Prince Horn who founded this this uh, collected all this work from the asylums of Europe and then a man called Jean de Buffy, a French painter, coined the phrase Arbreu, raw vision, outsider art. Um, and this is to do with a notion that there's a certain type of art which is because people have mental illness, it is, they are not culturated, they are enculturated. They are, their work has an innocence and a power, a raw vision. There are problems for me with this because Again, I think that we're not careful, we're just going to exoticize something and, or we're going to dismiss something. Uh, we, there's, there's sort of, there's, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, fragile territory. Um, this, uh, I wrote a piece in an asylum magazine called uh, Anthropologist of the Mind in which I kind of countered this idea of this, 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 this particular type of work. This is a piece of work which I have permission to show from a patient from Rampton Hospital. I work in Rampton Hospital as a chaplain and also uh, as an arts facilitator with, with uh, patients there. Um, and the reason I put this in in reference to this is this, this is another, these are voices from the margins. This is a, a particular uh, area where people who are often demonized, um, who are often um, uh, marginalized in many different ways, um, uh, can show their work and I brought an exhibition out of the hospital it went to Wakefield and it went to the Brewery Arts Centre in Kendall and was received by the public who came along for kind of wirist reasons maybe uh, the same could be said about any kind of marginal group you go along you know thinking oh patients from Brampton Hospital you know there's going to be kind of notorious people showing their work here and people were just bowled over by the beauty and the courage of that work it was very powerful work and one of the themes of today is transformation. And I think that, you know, certainly in my, my work that I've done over the last 12, 14 years has been about art as a capacity for transformation and how working with people in secure hospitals, in the community, can be a mechanism, as I wrote, that creativity is the immune system of the mind and the source of the mythic. And you can see this amazing piece of work by uh, Sebastian Wilbur, um, another one of his works. Uh, Sebastian now has shown at this, not his real name, he's shown at the ICA in London and he's starting to get some acknowledgement for his work. But, but that piece is, is all concerned with sexual ambiguity, with incarceration, with feelings of, of, of being boxed in and oppressed and so on. And, and I just want to offer it as a, a, final, um, a final sort of image from... Uh, a final image from, from this idea of a marginal voice. I just want to finish before we have a discussion, and I hope we are going to have a discussion about these, these issues, um, with a quote from a patient who, uh, again, I have permission to quote to you. Um, and this is about what, what value art has to this, this person. And when, one of the things, when I took the exhibition out of Rampton, of course the patients could, had no idea, they, they had no feedback, they didn't see um, that, that work in those situs. We had seminars, it was a big exhibition in both Wakefield and Kendall, but we, we took back the, um, the comments book, of the, of the public comments book, and uh, the comments were just remarkable about the courage and the, you know, how people were so moved by this work. And some, one of the patients actually cried, wept, because they, 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 nobody had ever said anything about his, his own narrative, his own work, his own position before. Nobody had praised him for what he'd done. And it was incredibly moving. And this is a, a quote that was used in the, the notes for the exhibition, which was uh, taken directly from a patient there, as to what art means to him as, as someone in the margins of society. He wrote, I don't plan nothing. When I work, it just comes naturally and none of it is thought out. I, I, I couldn't work this way every day, 
but I value it once a week. If I were to come more, I wouldn't get the emotion because I would be emotionally drained. I would have to force my emotions out. My influence was a mate in prison who had done over 20 years. He found inner peace with his artwork. He used to be very violent, but he found peace with art. Artists used to visit prison to see his work and he showed them some of mine. They saw things in my work I didn't know were there. Now I find that working here gives me inner peace. <laughs>